Hi everyone, my name's Victoria Carthew. Coming up, we'll be looking at sentences in English. In math, we'll be adding decimals in tenths. And in science, we'll be taking a look at the components and purpose of a simple circuit. First though, make yourselves comfortable so that you feel ready to learn about sentences. Sentences are the building blocks of our writing. They help us engage the audience and express meaning. The three different types of sentences you can use in your writing are simple sentences, compound sentences and complex sentences. Let's find out more. Hi everyone, I'm Rebecca and today we are going to be looking at different sentence structures that authors use. We want to be able to use different sentences in our writing so that we can maintain our reader's interest, help our writing flow and give the reader more information. Can you identify simple, compound and complex sentences? In a moment, we are going to look at different sentences. Some will be examples of simple sentences, some will be examples of compound sentences, and others will be examples of complex sentences. Your challenge will be to identify the type of sentence and to think about why it is simple, compound or complex. A simple sentence has one main clause. This means it contains a subject and a verb and makes sense on its own, expressing a complete idea or thought. An example of a simple sentence is, cane toads are amphibians. A compound sentence contains two main clauses joined by a coordinating conjunction. This means two main clauses are joined together by the words for, and, nor, but, or, yet, or so. An example of a compound sentence is, cane toads are amphibians and they have dry, bumpy skin. In this sentence, two main clauses, cane toads are amphibians, they have dry, bumpy skin, are joined by the coordinating conjunction, and. A complex sentence contains one main clause and one or more subordinate clauses. This means there is one main clause, which would make sense on its own, and one subordinate clause, which does not make sense on its own. The subordinate clause can go at the beginning, in the middle, or at the end of a sentence. An example of a complex sentence is, even though there have been many attempts at eradication, it has been impossible to get rid of cane toads. The main clause in this sentence, it has been impossible to get rid of cane toads, contains a subject and a verb and makes sense on its own. The subordinate clause in this sentence, even though there have been many attempts at eradication, also contains a subject and a verb, but it does not make sense on its own. To understand what this means, the reader needs the main clause. All right, let's play a game to see if we can identify simple, compound and complex sentences. To play this game, you will need some space to move. I'm going to read you a sentence. If you think it is a simple sentence, you will need to jump up and run to the left side of the room. If it's a compound sentence, run to the right of the room. If it's a complex sentence, stand in the middle of the room. Let's practice. I will read the sentence and model what to do. Remember, if it's a simple sentence, I will run to the left. If it's compound, I will run to the right. If it's complex, I will stand in the middle of the room. Is this a simple, compound or complex sentence? Cane toads are a pest and they are found in many parts of Australia. I'll say the sentence again. Cane toads are a pest and they are found in many parts of Australia. I'm thinking if I need to move to the left, the right or stay in the middle of the room. I think the sentence, cane toads are a pest and they are found in many parts of Australia is an example of a compound sentence. So I'm going to run to the right side of the room. I know this is a compound sentence, as I can see that it contains two main clauses. Cane toads are a pest is one main clause, and they are found in many parts of Australia is another main clause. I know both of these clauses contain a subject and a verb and make sense on their own. 
These two main clauses are joined by a coordinating conjunction and. I'm confident this is a compound sentence. Now that we've had a practice and I've shown you how to play, let's begin the game. Ready? Make sure you are positioned in the middle of the room. Here is our first sentence. Cane toads are poisonous and dogs should not lick them. Is that a simple, compound or complex sentence? Cane toads are poisonous and dogs should not lick them. Jump up and run to the part of the room that shows what type of sentence it is. As you are thinking about that sentence, you will have noticed two main clauses joined by a coordinating conjunction. So the sentence is an example of a compound sentence. Are you on the right hand side of the room? Everyone back to the middle of the room. Here is our second sentence. I don't like cane toads. Is that a simple, compound or complex sentence? I don't like cane toads. I don't like cane toads is an example of a simple sentence. So you should be on the left side of the room. Well done. Now let's move and sit in the middle of the room. Here is our third sentence. Cane toads poison many native animals. Is that a simple compound or complex sentence? Off you go. Did I trick you? Were you expecting a complex sentence to come next? Cane toads poison many native animals is another example of a simple sentence. So you should be standing on the left side of the room. Let's go back to the middle of the room for our last sentence. Even though they are relatively small, the toxins excreted by cane toads means they have few predators. Is that a simple, compound or complex sentence? Go. Even though they are relatively small, the toxins excreted by cane toads means they have few predators is an example of a complex sentence. So you are probably still in the middle of the room. The toxins excreted by cane toads means they have few predators is a main clause and even though they are relatively small, is a subordinate clause. Well done. As authors, we need to use different types of sentences to engage our reader, make our writing flow, and express our ideas. If we only use one sentence type, our writing may be boring, may not tell the reader what we need them to know, and might even be confusing. As you are reading today, look for simple sentences, compound sentences, and complex sentences. Can you find the main clause in these sentence? What about the subordinate clauses in complex sentences? Remember, using a variety of sentence types helps maintain our reader's interest, helps our writing flow, and gives the reader more information. Do the sentences you found in today's reading do this? Welcome back, it's now time for some maths. If you need to work out the best way to spend your pocket money or share your latest personal best running distance, you'll need to know how to use decimals. Let's check out how to use decimals to add tenths. Hi there, I'm Annie. It's great to see you. This morning, I went for a 20 minute run with my son. I ran 1.8 kilometres and my son ran 1.3 kilometres. If we ran a relay, what distance would we have run? In order to calculate this distance, we're going to look at how to add in tenths. Firstly, let's remind ourselves what a tenth is. A tenth is one part of a whole that's divided into 10 equal parts. You can have a tenth as a group of items, a tenth as a whole object, or tenths as a number. But if we wanted to add tenths together, how would we do that? Let's take a look. This is an abacus showing tenths, ones, tens and hundreds. Let's start adding tenths. One tenth, two tenths, three tenths, four tenths, five tenths. 
What would happen if we add four more tenths? What is the new number? Let's check. One, two, three, four. Five tenths add four tenths is nine tenths, or 0 0.9. What would happen if we add one more tenth? We have now used all 10 tenths. These 10 tenths have formed one whole. But what if we started with eight tenths? What happens if we add four tenths again? What new number is created? We've got 12 tenths altogether, which is 10 tenths and 2 tenths, or 1 whole and 2 tenths. A place value chart can be used to show this. Using a place value chart, let's have a look at the following expression. 5 tenths add 3 tenths. Here we have 5 tenths in the tenth place. Add another 3 tenths and we are provided with 8 tenths altogether. Our answer 5 tenths plus 3 tenths equals 8 tenths. Like all problems, there are many strategies we can use to find a solution. Here are two more strategies. Using the jump strategy, the jump strategy requires us to choose a number and break it into its place value parts. In this expression, 30 and 5 tenths add 3 and 3 tenths, we're going to look at the 3 and 3 tenths. Let's partition this number into ones and tenths. 3 and 3 tenths equals 3 ones and 3 tenths. First we will add the 3 ones and then we will add the 3 tenths. Remember, we're adding 3 and 3 tenths to 30 and 5 tenths. So let's locate 30 and 5 tenths on our number line. Count on 3 ones. 30 and 5 tenths add 3 whole equals 33 and 5 tenths. Now we've added the ones, we need to add the 3 tenths. After adding 3 ones, our starting point will now be 33 and 5 tenths. Add 3 tenths to our number. Our answer is now 33 and 8 tenths. 30 and 5 tenths add 3 and 3 tenths now equals 33 and 8 tenths. The split strategy. This strategy requires us to look at both numbers and break them into their place value parts. Partition 38 and 2 tenths into 38 ones and 2 tenths. Partition 2 and 1 tenth into 2 ones and 1 tenth. We can then add the whole numbers. 38 add 2 and then we can add the decimal numbers, 2 tenths add 1 tenth. Let's have a closer look. 38 add 2 equals 40. 2 tenths add 1 tenth equals 3 tenths. Add these two numbers together, 40 add 3 tenths gives us 40 and 3 tenths. Let's go back to my run this morning. Remember, I ran 1.8 kilometres and my son ran 1.3 kilometres. If we ran a relay, what distance would we have run? 1.8 kilometres is one whole kilometre and eight tenths of a kilometre. 1.3 kilometres is one whole kilometre and three tenths of a kilometre. I need to calculate the distance when we add them together. Let's start with the tenths. 8 tenths of a kilometre plus 3 tenths of a kilometre is 11 tenths or 1 whole and 1 tenth of a kilometre. Now we can add the whole kilometre. We have my whole kilometre plus my son's whole kilometre, which gives us 2 whole kilometres. We also have to add the whole we made from adding 10 tenths, so it is 3 whole kilometres. This calculation shows me that together my son and I could run a relay of 3 kilometres and 1 tenth of a kilometre, or 3.1 kilometres. Let's recap today's lesson. We know that we can add tenths and whole numbers using a number line, jump strategy or split strategy. Once there are 10 tenths, it forms a whole. You could measure the distance you walk or run in 20 minutes and you could challenge someone in your family to join you. Or you could plan a future trip to visit your family or friends by adding the distances you need to travel. 
The more you work with decimals, the more you notice how much you need them. See you next time. Time for some more useful information. Let's make sure we play it safe by listening to what you should know about the coronavirus. My name is Coronavirus, but you can call me COVID-19. I'm travelling the world right now. You might have heard of me. Breaking news, COVID-19 going viral. I'm a virus. Some of my friends are the common cold and flu. If you catch me, I can make you feel like this. Fever, I can't. hard to breathe. But I don't last long. And most kids get better quickly. I'll be off now. You can help stop me spreading. Learn how. Tip one, regularly wash your hands with soap and water for 20 seconds. Tip two, don't get too close to other people, including your friends. Tip three, cover your coughs and sneezes with a tissue or your elbow. Achoo! Tip four, if you feel sick, tell your parents straight away. If you're worried about me, that's okay. Talk to your parents, carer or family. Doctors are working hard to stop me. Make sure to follow instructions and we'll get through this together. Well, upper primary students, the next subject we have for you is science, and we'll be learning all about a simple circuit. Electricity is the flow of electrons around a circuit, and a circuit is the route that the electrical current can follow. So this time, in science, we're going to investigate the flow of electricity. Here's David with Circuit Connections. Hi. How many things can you see around you that use electricity? Have you ever wondered how light works, or maybe the toaster, or an electric drill. Today we're going to uncover just that. We'll learn about electrical circuits and their purpose. So, what is an electrical circuit? An electrical circuit consists of different components connected together. These are components that allow the flow of electricity, that is, electrical energy. So any object that needs electricity to work, like this little motor, contains at least one electrical circuit to make it go. The main components of an electrical circuit are an energy source, maybe a battery, wires, and a load that transforms electricity into light or movement or sound, like this little buzzer. Before we start handling too many of these electrical things, we better take a minute to talk about safety. Now, a tiny bit of electricity is quite safe, but like most things, too much of it can be very dangerous. Now, we measure the strength of electricity in volts, so this little battery is only 1.5 volts. It's quite safe for me to touch it and handle a circuit. A car battery is 12 volts and it's a lot bigger. Touching that can give you a painful shock. The electricity that comes out of a power point is 240 volts. That's very dangerous. So we should never touch the inside of a 240 volt device. And the big power cables that carry electricity from town to town, they're 11,000 volts, which is why they're up on such high towers to keep us safe. Now let's get back to our safe 1.5 volt circuits. Each component has a specific purpose. There's an energy source. For example, a battery provides energy to the circuit. So in this case, we're actually using two batteries, two lots of 
1.5 volts, so it's 3 volts, still quite safe. Then the wires that allow transfer of energy to flow from one part of the circuit to another. And then there's a load. So it could be a light or a buzzer to transform electrical energy into different form of energy. So light or sound. So let's look more closely at the circuit to explain the flow of electricity. So we'll connect it together here. I'm going to take a little battery pack, connect a wire, and connect it to our motor. So we've got electricity, we've got a motor, nothing happening. So I'll take another wire from the other side of the motor to the other side of the battery, and we've got some action. So you can see the motor spins when the battery is connected in the circuit. In this circuit, the battery contains stored chemical energy. And when the battery is connected to the circuit, the chemical energy is transformed into electrical energy. Then we connect to a motor when the energy flows or is transferred from one end of the battery around the circuit, the wires and the load, and back to the other end of the battery, that's called energy transfer. But we haven't gone back to the other end of the battery yet. Another lead. And we've got the energy being transformed and then transferred around the circuit. Now there's one other place in the circuit beside the battery where energy is transformed. And that is where one type of energy is changed into another type. Have a close look at the circuit and see if you can identify where a second transformation occurs. So the transformation occurs at the motor. When electrical energy flows from the wires through the motor, it's transformed into movement energy, which we can see when the motor spins. So at the moment the electricity is flowing around the circuit, we know that because there's an output at our load. That is, the motor is spinning. When electricity is flowing around the circuit, it's called a complete circuit. However, if we remove the battery from the circuit, the motor stops. There's no longer electricity flowing through the circuit. So it's now an incomplete circuit. We could also use a switch to make it more easy rather than disconnecting a wire. So I'm going to um, put in this little switch I made out of a paper clip. And connect that. Connect that. And let's see if it works. We have a complete, whoop, didn't connect it very well. There we go. Complete circuit, incomplete circuit. Let's review what we've learnt today. We now know that an electrical circuit is made up of components that are connected to allow the flow of electricity. Number two, energy transfer occurs when electricity flows from the battery through wires. And number three, energy transformation occurs when the electricity is changed into a different type of energy. So that's it for today, but here's something to try at home. Try making a list of all the devices around your home that you can find that are powered by electricity. And beside each one, note what form of energy it transforms electricity into. For example, light or heat or motion or sound. By the way, you might find some devices that do more than one transformation. A hairdryer, for example, has a fan motor with motion, but it's also got a heater. See what you can find, and uh, we'll see you next time. 
Yes, we will, David. Wasn't that interesting? Well, that's it for Learning at Home TV today, but boy, we've managed to pack a whole lot of useful learning and information into the last couple of hours. And the good news is that we'll be back next week for more. In the meantime, stay safe and positive and make sure you look out for each other. Be sure to stay at home, wash your hands and to remember those rules about social distancing. Have a great day. We'll see you soon.